All right, sweet. Yeah, I, I love hearing updates like that. I mean, um, yeah, I, I remember that was when I was in junior high, that was a really formative couple of years and I, I love hearing about their work. So that's, that's so good. Uh, my name is Gordon. I'm one of the small group leaders here. And today I have the privilege of sharing God's word with you. Um, yeah, I mean, last week, Pastor Daryl kicked us off a mini-series within the bigger book of Ephesians. And so today we're going to be continuing that. If you missed anything, feel free to go on YouTube. There's a collection of everything, and you can follow along with the series. Um, you know, when putting together a message, there's usually a significant amount of time diving into the Word, praying, asking God to reveal certain things to highlight within the verse. Um, but there's also a lot of time spent reflecting. And I was, when I was reflecting on this verse there was a memory that kept coming back to me. Maybe you could relate to this, maybe you can't. Um, but I want you to try to think back to when you first came to know the Lord. I mean, I don't know how many people here grew up in a Christian household, but you know, I, I, I did not. So I remember distinctively when I came to know the Lord, there was just this undescribable hunger that you just couldn't get enough of the Word. You, you wanted to learn more about God's character. If you took out my calendar from that time, I think... Out of seven days, maybe four or five days were filled with church activities because I just wanted to learn more about God. And at that church, every Friday, they had a Bible study. It was probably my favorite thing to attend outside of Sundays. It was more of a small group setting. You got to deep dive into the Word a little bit. And through the grace of God, through the leaders there, I had some amazing leaders. A lot of the verses that we covered, the meaning or the depth behind it came relatively quickly. Uh, except for this one verse. And Pastor Darrell actually covered this last week. I don't have a slide for this, so I'm going to go ahead and read it to you. It's from Ephesians 6.12, and it says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So when I read that, I was like, okay, that makes sense. Enemies, not flesh. There's something greater going on. But my pastor kept going back to the last two words of that verse, which was heavenly realms. And he kept asking, well, what does that mean? What is heavenly realms? And I kept thinking, like, I don't know, is that like heaven? Or is that, is that something that's happening in heaven? And for the next month or so, when we would connect, he would explain what the verse meant. And that was probably the first time that I started to explore this idea of spiritual warfare. And the only way that my mind could comprehend it at that time was I just visualized like a parallel universe. Essentially, what happens on earth would affect the spiritual realm or the heavenly realms and vice versa. And that was the only way that my mind could grasp that in the very beginning. So naturally, in talking about spiritual warfare, that bleeds into spiritual attack. Because in order for there to be warfare, there has to be attack of some kind. And so I spent a lot of time asking him, what are spiritual attacks? Like, what does that actually look like? And in our conversations, he explained to me that, you know, spiritual warfare is something that happens in the midst of us. Whether you know it or not, whether you believe it or not, it's something that is consistently happening. And within spiritual battles, there's spiritual forces for good and there's spiritual forces for evil. You know, as believers, as Christians, we're called to love God, love God's people, share the good news of Jesus with people, help those who are disenfranchised. These are a few examples of spiritual forces for good. At the same time, the enemy wants to do everything he can to stop that. So Satan, his demons, will always try to attack and put that to a stop. So that could look like spiritual oppression. Spiritual attack could look like fear, condemnation, all types of temptation to sin, uh, even the love of the world. That's a really big one too. And Satan's ultimate purpose is to destroy us. And he's trying to destroy our spirit, our body, our soul, and potentially even all three. And so this was me learning about that. And it started to make sense, especially as I got older and I experienced more life. I mean, think about this. Have you ever noticed, maybe in your own life, have you ever noticed that spiritual attacks tend to happen right before you're about to do something either big for the kingdom or a transitional period in your life or just something that is significant to your spiritual growth. The enemy loves to attack during those specific seasons. I remember after Rochelle and I got married, we uh, rented an apartment 
and we rented for about six months before we moved into uh, our house. And at the time, it was a fixer-upper, and we moved in the middle of winter. And I remember things started to happen that kind of started a cascade. I mean, the first thing that happened was we moved in, and first of all, it was an adjustment. The apartment was a little bit smaller, but it was, it was pretty new. So that was already kind of an adjustment to go into a fixer-upper. The air quality, for whatever reason, started to get sore throats. We weren't sure what was happening there. In the middle of winter, the furnace went out. And so we had to look for contractors. This is all in the span of like a month. And then after that, our washer and dryer broke. So we had to take our clothes to a laundromat for a season. The car that was transporting everything, we started to get a bunch of nails in our tires. I think I counted like six. I didn't realize it was leaking air until I brought it to the shop. And it all, of, it all crescendoed one night. And I remember, I'm a light sleeper. I was sleeping. And in the middle of the night, I hear what sounded like a car struggling to go up the hill. And so I remember mid-sleep, I thought, oh, it must have snowed last night. So a car is probably struggling to get up the hill. And then maybe 30 seconds later, I go to the living room. I peek outside around the corner. And I didn't see any snow, but what I saw was my bumper was on the ground and the back of my car was caved in. So what I think happened was someone did a hit and run. So we called the police, got a police report. And these types of spiritual attacks, it's not just me. That's just one example of it. I talked to my missionary friends who are doing work overseas. I've heard stories of their kids having a hard time, their kids being bullied in school. I have a missionary friend Recently, maybe about a year ago, she discovered a mass in her neck. So her, her husband, her family had to fly over to Thailand to get that removed. Some people deal with isolation issues, depression, visa issues. And these are all examples of the enemy loving, loving um, to attack us when we're doing something big. Because this is essentially what the enemy does. I mean, have you ever noticed that wise believers... Before they do something big or before something happens, they always ask for prayer, for protection against spiritual attack. And maybe you've experienced this before. Maybe you were a recent graduate. Maybe you moved to a new state. Maybe you moved here recently from another city. Maybe you dealt with some form of spiritual attack. Maybe this is your first semester in college away. Maybe you're starting a new job. Maybe you're serving in a different capacity at church. So the question is, when we are dealing with these types of spiritual attacks, what are we actually supposed to do? Do we even have an option? Or are we essentially just sitting ducks waiting to be picked off? The comforting news is that not only does God understand that we deal with spiritual attack and there's spiritual warfare, but he's actually equipped us with things that we can use to fight in this spiritual battle. And so all up today, we're going to be covering two pieces of spiritual armor. We're going to dissect it a little bit from a historical standpoint. Then we're going to move into how the enemy likes to attack within that context. And lastly, we're going to walk away with a few application points that I think we can practice uh, this week, throughout the week. Okay, so we're going to be reading God's word. If you don't mind, we're going to stand together. It's only one verse today, and it's going to be from Ephesians 6.14. And it says this, Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. All right, let's have a seat. Yeah. Okay, so do not fall into the same trap that I did as a youth, okay? When you're reading the Bible, have you ever notice that usually there's a subtitle and then a block of text? I remember when I was reading, it said, armor of God. And I was like, oh, it's about to get good. So I was imagining, okay, what armor of God, are we talking about like levitation boots? Are we talking about <laughs> animanium armor that can like repel energy? Are we talking about like a sword that can shoot bullets or something? I, my mind was going all over the place. And then when I actually read it, it said a belt. <laughs> so I was confused. <laughs> Because, you know, when I think of a belt, I mean, I, I, I literally just think of like a plain belt on one end, and then I've, I've seen like very decorative, elaborate belts. You know, like some people really love to get like a designer belt, and that kind of like, I don't know, takes their outfit to the next level or something. 
I don't know how many people are from the South. I don't mean to make fun of the South. I've seen people from the South with like those, you know, cowboy buckles. I've seen those kinds of belts. I mean, I've even seen WWE championship belts <laughs> with the diamonds on it, okay? So when I was thinking belt, I was like, okay, this is more of a decorative thing. Like, why would God lead with the belt? And I was confused. But as I matured, I started to understand the context a little bit more, which is so critical. When Paul was writing the letter of Ephesians to the church of Ephesus, he was actually in Rome. He was in prison. And a lot of scholars say that he interacted with a, a lot of different Roman soldiers. So when he was writing the spiritual armor, a lot of it is based off of what the Roman soldiers were wearing. And they're actually metaphors for certain things. And so once I started to understand that, I'm like, oh, okay, that makes a little bit sense. Then I did a little bit more research. Well, what was the functionality of the belt for the Roman soldiers? And this kind of blew my mind as well because I didn't know this. Roman soldiers carried around 50 to 75 pounds of armor. That included the breastplate, that included tunic, that included the sword, that included the belt, um, just all kinds of armor. I think certain type of uh, tunics had were a little bit heavier to prevent, you know, like sword attacks and things like that. And a lot of scholars say that the belt was actually the most important piece of the Roman soldier's armor. And the reason is because it carried the load. So without the belt, your breastplate could be all crooked, unsymmetrical. You would have nowhere to put your sword. Everything would be out of whack. You would have to like fix yourself every other minute. And so the belt carried the load. I mean, even for those of you who are into fitness, if you've ever talked to, uh, you know, fitness expert, personal trainer, maybe you're into exercise yourself, one of the key things that a lot of trainers will tell you is that core strength is critical because it stabilizes the rest of your body. Or else you might get injured, you might use bad form. So right here, Paul is essentially saying to us, foundationally, that biblical truth as the foundation is the stabilizer for everything else as he's about to build on that, which is so critical for us and so relevant, right? I mean, think about it. The last time you went through your social media feed, I don't think it's uncommon for you to come across a topic that you are really persuaded by. You're like, wow, they made some really good arguments. I never thought about it like that. That makes a lot of sense. And then later on, you hear another argument from the opposite side, maybe more of a testimonial argument or perspective. And you think to yourself, wow, that's, yeah, totally, like, that makes sense. And in the grand scheme of things, we're being swayed from one side to the other. Because if we don't have solid foundational objective truth, feelings can usually take hold of what we believe. And as feelings, we all know feelings are fleeting. They can change. And so essentially, we live in a society where sometimes that is more important than truth. And I get it, as believers, sometimes it's hard to maintain interpersonal relationships because if there's a topic that we have a stance on that may not be popular opinion, that can ultimately sway us as well. So I think it's just so critical and also so relevant that Paul leads with the belt of truth because that's something that we uh, deal with today, probably even more so than ever. Now, beyond the purpose and functionality of the belt, it's actually also a metaphor for preparedness. This was something that was really interesting as well. Essentially, what Paul is saying, before you go into battle, having your belt is critical so that you are prepared. I mean, for most of you, this morning, when you drove to church, hopefully, one of the first things that you did was put on your seatbelt because you're trying to be prepared in case of an accident, in case something happens. I mean, I know it's been a while because of COVID, but if you remember when you went on a plane, right, one of the first things that they'll tell you before they can even take off is to fasten your seatbelt. And it's also not uncommon, once you hit turbulence, for the stewardess to say over the intercom, hey, tighten your seatbelt maybe another notch so that you can be prepared and weather the storm when things are really unstable around us. So again, the belt of truth is really rooted in preparedness and it's rooted in biblical foundation. Now the breastplate, little bit more straightforward in terms of its functionality. Roman soldiers wore breastplates to cover their front and their back, mainly to protect their vital organs. And the most vital organ that the breastplate was meant to protect is the heart, okay? Proverbs 4.23 says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. 
So the breastplate is straightforward. What does righteousness mean? Well, righteousness simply means right living. So correct living, living the way that God wants you to live, whether that be in your job, in your relationships, in your stewardship. And truth bleeds right into right living because if we know God's truth, then we know how to live correctly in accordance to God's will. And when we're not living righteously, that is when we are primed for the enemy to attack. So then naturally, the next question is, okay, now we understand these two pieces of our armor. Well, how does the enemy like to attack, especially in the context of truth? What are we supposed to do? Now, Satan's attacks may seem complex, but really, he just has three goals. He likes to deceive, he likes to divide, and he likes to destroy. And it's almost like this. The more we know about how the enemy likes to attack, the better we can prepare for it. I mean, think about in a football game. If you knew what your opponent was going to do, if you knew that they're going to run 90% of the time, that gives you a high likelihood of stopping the run, right? This similar principle. And when we're dealing with Satan, we're essentially dealing with the father of lies. I mean, he knows how to lie so well. I want to point out a verse in John 8, 44. It says this, He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his own character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. So essentially, this is pointing out that Satan, his native tongue is lying. He's done that from the beginning. And throughout all this time, he's gotten really good at lying. So today, I want to go over a few different ways that I've personally identified and have experienced the way that Satan lies. This is not an exhaustive list but I feel like it's a good place to start. The first type of lie that the enemy likes to use are the most basic generic vanilla lies. They're just flat out lies. There's nothing unique about it. It's just a regular lie. Things like, did the Bible really say that stealing is a sin or was that just somehow mistranslated? You know, is the human heart apart from God truly evil? I mean, you've done so many good deeds in your life. There's so many good people on this earth. How can they possibly be evil? How can they possibly deserve damnation? Is Christ truly the only way to heaven? I mean, he can't be. There's so many other religions out there. A loving God would not be that exclusive. That doesn't make sense. He wouldn't do that. I mean, don't you think the Bible's a bit outdated when it comes to maybe sexual sin or gender? Because I do. And don't you think the Bible is a little bit wrong when it comes to pleasing the flesh? I mean, as long as you're not harming anybody else, who really cares what you do to feel better? Okay, now these are flat-out lies. And if you're walking closely with God, as those statements were being uttered, alarm bells, red flags were going off because you were able to identify that. However, if you don't have a close relationship with God, or maybe if you've been distant from God, some of those statements are not as clear-cut. In fact, they might not even ring any alarms. When I was around seven years old, I was sitting in front of a restaurant with my cousin in Chinatown. I don't know how many people grew up in Chinatown. I grew up in the ID. Uh, my mom had a karaoke shop there. My cousin or my uncle has a restaurant there. And so we were standing in front of this restaurant. The, the Seattle OG heads will remember this. It was, it was a restaurant called China Gate. It was on 7th Avenue South. Uh, doesn't exist anymore, sadly. So we were sitting out there, and we were just having a conversation. And all of a sudden, this guy walks by. And he had a bag with him. And he stopped. You know, we're kids, like eight years old. And he stops, and he goes, hey, do you guys want to buy some games? And I was like, what kind of games? <laughs> and so he pulled out his bag, and he had Nint Super Nintendo games. He had Nintendo 64 games. And so I was looking through his collection, and I was like, ooh, NFL Blitz, I don't have that. But, ooh, Mortal Kombat, the, the Sub-Zero edition, okay, I don't have that either. And so I asked him, hey, how, how, how much are you selling your games for? He was like, $2. And I said, okay, I had a $5 bill. I said, I'll buy two games, but you know, I can't afford it anymore because I have $5. He was like, okay, I'll throw, I'll, I'll throw in another one. So I was like, oh, five for three? Like, that's a great deal. So I was getting excited. Got the game, and as he was leaving... He said, oh, by the way, if you and your cousin are interested, I'm actually selling a Dreamcast, okay? 
could be an outdated reference. At one point, Sega made hardware, okay? It happened. It was, the last, it was like the death, you know, the nail in the coffin, but it was a great system. Anyway, so he said, yeah, I'm selling a Dreamcast $20. And I was like, oh, okay, where is it? He said, well, my partner and I were unloading a shipment at, um, at our warehouse on Dearborn. You know, if you want to come over with us, then you, you, you could get it. So I went into the restaurant, talked to my dad. I said, hey, dad, can I get 20 bucks? I want to buy this video game. And he was like, okay. So I took it, and I walked down there. We get to the front of the warehouse, and he said, hey, I need to go inside. My partner's unloading the shipment. Hold my watch for collateral. Give me the 20 bucks, and I'll be right back. And so maybe like a couple minutes passed, he came back out and he said, hey, actually my partner's still unloading stuff. Let me get my watch back. Um, do you want to come in with us or do you want me to bring it out? Now at that point, I am eight years old, okay? My street smarts has not fully developed yet. <laughs> that Beacon Hill logic has not developed. It was in the process of developing. But luckily, through the grace of God, fortunately, I felt that something was off. So I told him, um, actually, could you bring it back to the restaurant when you have it? And I'll just wait for you there. And I just booked it back there. Now, obviously, at the time, I didn't realize I was being lied to. I probably didn't even realize that the games I bought were probably stolen from somewhere. And in the same way, if my dad had educated me, if he had told me about these things, maybe I would have been a little bit more aware. And a similar principle happens when we're not walking closely with God, we have a tendency to not be able to detect even the most simple and basic of lies because we need to be walking close to God. The second type of deception, I feel like this is probably the most um, crafty type of a lie. And this type of a lie is partial truth lies. So the enemy likes to take a part of the Bible that may be true and then somehow mask a lie at the end of it to make you think that it's actually biblical truth. I mean, tell me if you've heard this one. Um, yes, the Bible does say that the love of money is the root of all evil. Yes, the Bible also says that you cannot serve both God and money. But really, though, if God loves you, he wants you to experience health and wealth. I mean, you can essentially experience heaven on earth. You don't have to wait until you get to heaven. You've heard that one before. Another thing that he likes to say is, you know, maybe this is a little bit more nuanced, but doesn't God say that every believer has a spiritual gift? And aren't there certain gifts that you should desire more? Well, you, you don't even have a gift. So that must mean that God doesn't really love you then, because if you truly had these gifts, then you would be favored. But you're clearly not favored. I mean, maybe you've even heard this one. Yes, reading the word and spending time in fellowship with God is so important. But, man, you've had a busy week at work. Like, you barely even have time to yourself. What about your alone time? And aren't you, don't you have kids? Like, did you even spend time with your kids? What about your spouse? Did you spend time with your spouse? I mean, the word can always wait until tomorrow, right? You'll always have more time. And these are the type of subtle lies that, can somehow affect us because, you know, the, the, the truth is, no, there won't always be more time. We're never guaranteed to have more time. Tomorrow's not even promised. And no, God doesn't promise health and wealth and everything your heart desires while we're on earth. But a lot of the times it can seem alluring and we can lose focus on that. I love this quote from Charles Spurgeon. He's a theologian because it hits so hard. It says, discernment is not about knowing the difference between right and wrong. It's knowing the difference between right and almost right. And I think that is so clutch, especially in the time and day and age that we live in today, where objective truth gets more and more blurred with every passing day. The third type of lie is getting you to second guess a past miracle that maybe God had revealed or God had shown you in your life. Do you remember a situation where God did something really crazy, where you really prayed fervently for it, and God actually came through, and you thought you felt so loved, and, and everything was just at a different level. You felt so close and intimate with God. And then as more time passes, you just somehow slowly start to forget. Have you ever experienced that before? I mean, I know I have. It could be in the form of this. Maybe 
you went on a summer project, a summer mission trip, and God completely changed your heart. God really spoke into your life. And by the time you got back, you realized that God had been calling you to long-term missions. And so you're fired up about it. You start the visa process, things start to happen, but inevitably things start to get harder. And maybe visas are having, you know, you're having a hard time with getting your visas process. Or maybe things are starting to get more comfortable and you start to think to yourself, or maybe the enemy is trying to tell you things like, well, you know, if you're gonna serve in that country, you can pretty much forget about the modern luxuries or the comforts that you've grown accustomed to. I mean, are you sure God called you to do long-term missions? What if, can't you just go every summer or maybe every other summer? Wouldn't you still make a similar impact? You can meet God halfway, can't you? And you have kids. Like, can you imagine putting your kids through that type of education that is so many notches below what America has to offer? You would be a really terrible parent if you did that. And so that one strong fire slowly gets diminished a little bit. Maybe it's not a mission trip. Maybe at one point in your life you prayed really hard for a job opportunity. Maybe a job that you were completely unqualified for. And you were like, if God gives me this job, then clearly I'm going to do something with it. Because it can't just be so I can earn an income. There has to be something spiritual going on. There has to be something deeper. And as more time passes, maybe you start to get into a routine. Maybe there's a difficult season and you start to ask yourself, when I was hired by this recruiter, was it truly God that did that? Or did they just see this untapped potential within me? Maybe it was actually my talent that got me in that position. And yes, I know that God did put it on my heart to outreach to these non-believers, my coworkers, but man, they get on my nerves. I don't even want to reach out to them anymore. Or maybe perhaps you felt an amazing healing one day, or you had prayed for a healing, or for a family member, and God came through, and you said, you know, I'm going to dedicate my life to you. And as time passes, that fire starts to wean. It's almost like um, an analogy would be if you were <clears throat> hired into a new position and maybe you got into the office for the first time and you notice this huge crack in the wall. And you've never seen that before. So you told your person who brought you in, hey, why is there a crack on the wall? I should really call a contractor to get that fixed. And then a couple months go by, three months go by. You're walking in again, you see that crack again, and you're like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, someone should, really, someone should really get on top of that. And then maybe a year later, you're bringing in a new recruit, and they said, hey, someone should fix that wall. And you say something like, oh, yeah, that's always been there. Because if we start to get comfortable when we get into a pattern, sometimes we can lose focus of some of these miraculous things that God has shown us. <laughs> And so Jesus says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. If we're following Christ, then we're always going to be in the truth. But if we're not walking in truth, we're in prime position to be attacked. That's where fear of man comes in, and we start to believe the lies of Satan. And so we covered a few different ways that the enemy likes to lie. At this part of the message, I want to transition into a few different practical things that we can practice as early as this week to help combat some of these lies. And I think all of these are really clutch and important for us to practice on a regular basis. The first thing is to memorize scripture. I know this sounds kind of straightforward. There's so many different ways to do this, but let me tell you the reason behind it first. Sometimes we're, when we're in that tension point of being tempted, we have a split second to make a decision. Maybe we have a couple of minutes. It is so clutch to be able to go back to scripture that you've memorized that speaks truth. Some people like to create topicals. So they have a spreadsheet or they write it out and they have specific topics and they put verses underneath each topic. Some people like to memorize just one verse at a time where maybe they'll print out a verse and they'll put it next to their mirror. They'll put it on their refrigerator. They'll put it in... Uh, kind of in the car somewhere so that it's constantly within your vision. Another thing that you could do, my wife does this, she'll take a verse that she's trying to remember and she'll take the first letter of every word, turn it into an acronym and use it as a password. So depending on what she memorizes, she's always typing in and she has to think, okay, yeah, that word, that word, that word. And then the next thing you know, she comes to remember a verse. So verse memorization is clutch because you can always have that in your heart and you don't know when you're going to need it. The second thing that you can do 
but this is probably one of my favorites. It's to document or journal God's miracles in your life or when God gives you a conviction. I look back at journals from 2011, 2012, and sometimes when I'm reading it, it's almost like I get transported back. And I remember, oh my gosh, yeah, at that time, this was a huge deal. I remember this. And then maybe I look a little further, I'm like, wow, this conviction that I wrote two pages on, I, I barely even remember that. What happened to that? And if we're able to write down these convictions on the spot or when we're feeling it at its height and go back to that often, there's a less chance that the enemy could get us to forget just how potent those convictions were at the time. This is something that I really recommend. The third thing that you could do is personal accountability. This is also a really good one. If you've been attending church, maybe you're a transplant, highly suggest you get plugged into a small group so that you can connect with other believers. But this is critical because when we're, when we're able to rely on our brothers or sisters during times of confusion, they can anchor us and they can remind us of truth. I have a few brothers on, in my phone that I know I can call at any time and they got my back. They'll pray for me, we could talk it through, and they'll always speak biblical truth to me, even if it's not easy to hear. So memorizing scripture, documenting or journaling God's workings, and consistent and regular accountability. Ultimately, the most valuable truth that I want to leave on beyond some of these practical things that you can exercise is a reminder that the Holy Spirit has given us the power to engage in spiritual warfare so that we're not just playing defense all the time and so that we're not just always being under attack. And the awesome thing is, the truth is, the more times you say no to temptation, the stronger you become. Now, at this time, I want to call up the music team as we conclude the message. You know, I just want to give a reminder that as a community, if we consistently hold on to truth in the face of temptation or questions, then as a unit, we could continue to make such a big impact in our community and for the kingdom. Um, so the next time you run into situations where people say things like, hey, don't you realize that you know, science has disproven X? Or you know, don't you think you have an outdated view on you know, perspective on marriage or gender? Or don't you think that we're beyond that? Um, when we find ourselves in that type of chaos, may we continue to love on people in wisdom share the gospel with them in love, but ultimately hold on to objective truth and tighten the belt of truth as we engage in battle. For Christ is truly our foundation. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and close this off in a word of prayer and then we can transition to worship. Father, we just thank you for your mercy in our lives. Thank you for loving us enough to remind us of your truth Thank you for enabling us to be able to engage in spiritual warfare through Holy Spirit. Thank you for giving us objective foundational truth that we can always lean on. In a society where we're being pulled left and right with different feelings and, and beliefs, I pray that we would be rooted in you as a community. Help us to love on those who don't yet know you. Help us to live out our callings so that we can be effective with our limited time on this earth. Father, we're just so grateful for your love. And we want to continue to live in truth and we want to continue to do your will. So would you continue to enable us and teach us and grow us so that we can love you more with all our hearts, Lord. We pray all these in your precious name, Jesus. Amen.